reconciling archaeological and linguistic evidence for Berber prehistory. Uh, this is perhaps slightly out of the usual archaeological talk, um, but anyway, uh, see how it goes. So, Berber languages are particularly well studied as these things go, and we can try and compare their geographical extent today with the past. We can reconstruct basic and cultural vocabulary, which can be attributed to speakers of Proto-Berber. However, there's a chart, there's a major problem reconciling this with textual and archaeological evidence. The Proto-Berber that we can reconstruct, that is linguistically, seems to be far too recent from what we know from other evidence. Indeed, it seems to reach back to a period as late as 200 AD. Text evidence, that is uh, epigraphic evidence, points to a period prior to 400 BC. However, if we try and correlate the spread of Berber with archaeology, then this presumably will be the spread of pastoralism across the Sahara. And of course, this is five to 4,000 years ago. So what I'm kind of doing in this presentation is explore this disjunction, suggest the explanation must lie in massive language leveling in the period from 080 onwards, uh, which implies effectively that the original Berber speakers did indeed spread out westward from the Nile Valley 5,000 to 4,000 years ago, but the prior diversity of Berber was eliminated by processes which leveled out, I got or did away with divergent speech forms. Um, perhaps I can express this in relation to English. Uh, you know, a thousand years ago, England would have been full of extremely diverse dialects. It would have been hardly intelligible to speakers. However, uh, from the 14th century onwards, when England was increasingly unified as an administrative kingdom, then standard English spreads out and gradually it replaces the old regional varieties. So this is not something historical linguists like very much, frankly, they like nice tidy arguments which have languages spreading out uh, in trees rationally from proto languages. But nonetheless, I believe the evidence is, is mounting of the importance of these processes in various cultures. So, what's going on with Berber? Well, I think that there's two things going on. One is the Berber, is, is the Berber camel. That is, the Berbers get hold of the camels, which is quite late. It's maybe 50 to 100 AD. So suddenly they have a uh, domestic animal which enables them to move over huge distances in the desert, much further than, for example, when you're moving around with a herd of sheep or goats or but the second thing that happens is the establishment of the Roman limes, that is the southern border of the Roman Empire in North Africa, uh, which becomes a, an effective line. Uh, there are Berbers both sides of it, but beyond the limes, there are mobile uh, traders and raiders, and inside the line, they are basically farmers who are adapting their farming system to the new practices introduced by the Romans. So just to step back a little further with Berber, Berber languages are one of the six branches of the Afro-Asiatic language family. They're spoken both by settled and nomadic populations along the North African coast and far down into the Sahara, and they presently reach the borders of Nigeria. Now if we look at the map, Today, Berber languages are confined to a series of islands surrounded by Arabic, except where they touch on sub-Saharan African languages. Uh, the fur, most far-flung group of Berber are the Benaga in southwest Mauritania. When the French colonials first arrived in the 19th century, they were quite a significant group of uh, population, but unfortunately, they're now down to some 300 speakers. 
uh, quite recently described are the Tetzeret, who are the Berbers of uh, Agadez and Niger. Their language shows correspondences with Zinaga, but they are, of course, today entirely surrounded by the Tuareg. Other intriguing islands of Berber speakers uh, occur, for example, in Libya, at Algila, and unfortunately, formerly at El Tukawa, and also the famous oasis of Siwa. It's generally supposed, and my other talk discusses this in more detail, that the Berbers probably reached the Canary Islands and are at the basis of the, of the people known today as the Guanche, the Aboriginal population, which has unfortunately now disappeared. So, the paradox then is that given this vast geographical dispersal, the internal diversity of Berbers is extremely low. The French tradition, which goes back to the 1840s, is to treat la langue berber as if it were just a single language. Although this is not the case, neither can Berber really be divided into uh, 26 languages as the epilogue has it. Borrowing and various contact phenomena between already closely related languages suggests it's more helpful to conceptualize Berber as a dialect chain with outliers, including Zanaga, Tetsuret, and Siwi. If this is the case, then this low level of diversity points to a recent epoch for the dispersal of proto berber And one way we can look at this is by reconstructing Neo-Punic and Latin borrowings into Berber, which of course point to a considerably later date, namely 100 to 200 AD. Why would Berber be so different then from the rest of Afroasiatic? Afroasiatic, I mind you, if we look at this chart, you can see uh, here's Berber down here. It's perhaps relatives, and most close relatives are Egyptian and Semitic, and further away are uh, the Cushitic, uh, Omotic, and Chadic languages, in, respectively, in Ethiopia and Chadic across Central Africa, especially in Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad. So Why is it so remote? Well, if we look at the grammar of Berber, it, it aligns strongly with Semitic. Most genealogical trees trace these two branches next to each other. Berber verbal affixes are strikingly similar to Semitic, both in form, function, and position. So these presumably are inhabited from the common ancestor. However, once we take out the Arabic loan words, then Berber looks extremely different from all the other branches of Afroasiatic. How old is Afroasiatic in general? Well, it's difficult to gauge, and there are two strongly competing views, one of which is that it is linked to the Near East, the Tufian, and the other to Southwest Ethiopia. The earliest Semitic written material is Akkadian, dating from 250 BC, but the city of Akkad, at least, is referred to in Sumerian documents as early as 2800 BC. This suggests that we can't give a date for less than 6,000 people of Semitic speakers to enter the Near East and become established. If this is so, then there's a split from Berber prior to this, presumably the Nile Valley, perhaps as early as 6,500 BP. A date such as this is reasonable in terms of the erosion of common Afroasiatic roots of Berber, in other words, the, the loss of those roots which link the family together. But then, of course, the contrast with the dialect chain, the single language appearance of modern Berber is even more stark. Clearly, we need a, a complex paleo socio linguistic a hard term, but anyway, you, you get the idea looking at socio uh, sociolinguistic changes in the past to account for the present situation. So, 20 years ago now, I wrote a paper suggesting that we can reconstruct livestock production of proto Berber. 
that's the case, then it might seem reasonable to associate Barber with pastoralism in the archaeological record. Difficulty with this is that the cattle seem to be rather early in the Sahara, and thus not easily correlated with an undiverse linguistic group such as the Berber. The earliest dates for cattle in Africa are debated because it's difficult to be sure the skeletons represent domesticated species. Wild cattle existed in Northeast Africa, and by the time of Nabucaya, they may have been managed by humans, i.e. 9,000 years ago. Uh, Savino de Lernia has radiocarbon dated a large number of cattle bur burials in Mesak in southern Libya, and they give a fairly consistent tweet of dates pointing to the introduction of livestock circa 7,000 BP. Bones of small ruminants also occur in these burials, together with occasional other species such as equids, uh, that's presumably the wild ass. And this westward expansion of livestock uh, culminates in Mauritania by around 3,500 years ago. Um, so that, in, if you like, is the end of the Berber or other expansion of uh, pastoralism across the Sahara. To model this leveling process, a date must be congruent with the archaeological record. Fortunately, we have a couple of indicators of this in the forms of loans from Punic and Latin. Punic is an extinct Semitic language spoken in the overseas Phoenician Empire in North Africa, which included Carthage and some Mediterranean islands. The Phoenicians originated in what's now Lebanon, and they created the seaborne empire of Carthage. Uh, I won't attempt to pronounce the Punic uh, name for a new city, uh, this was established as a Semitic-speaking colony in North Africa by 800 BC and was destroyed uh, by the Romans in 146 BC. Unfortunately, the Romans also destroyed the, the libraries following the Third Punic War, so our understanding of the language in our later Neo-Punic, uh, a, a mostly inscriptional language uh, in North Africa. Uh, it's unfortunate we therefore don't have, we can't make a proper dictionary of Punic. Uh, there are bits and pieces of intriguing evidence. There's a play by Plautus called Punilus, uh, which it, contains a few lines in spoken Punic. And this has helped us a great deal because it tells us what the vowels sound like. Uh, here's the uh, Carthaginian Empire and its greatest extent. And here's the relevant play by Plautus, uh, which gives us some great insights into Punic language. Uh, we all can also tell a great deal about the uh, lifestyle of <coughs> Punic settlements because they introduced a lot of Near Eastern plants, which weren't at that time cultivated in uh, North Africa. Uh, the seeds melons, big palms and oils come from quite recent archaeobotanical research. So, apart from Punic loans into Baba, uh, there are also a very large number of Latin loans. I'm not going to read out all these tables, look at them at the link, and create a link for yourself. But anyway, we find especially in Kabyle, which is language typical of Algeria, uh, a great many roads learned from Latin uh, concerning fairly, you know, both natural world things, but also intriguing words like the word for pub and the word for paper and the type of bed. In terms of the production system, of course, one of the most interesting things are the borrowings from orchards and farms. Uh, relating to them, that, that is, I mean, you can grow plants such as celery, chard, and beans, and uh, various types of uh, olive, olive uh, product, uh, are, are all borrowed from Latin into mostly Kabyle, but also some from other Berber lectures of the Maghreb. Particular introduction of the uh, Romans was the plough, the 
vowels unknown previously, and therefore almost all words related to plowing, which of course created a major increase in productive capacity in a system that otherwise only be handhold, these are all borrowed from uh, Latin. Uh, this is the argument here. Now, the, the key part of my argument concerns the introduction of the camel. The camel appears to spread along the North African coast between 1500 AD. The Romans quickly adopted it in order for fast military movement, but it becomes also adopted into the agricultural system. Uh, camels are very strong, and we see quite a few representations of, of them being used in this way. So together with the camel is the establishment of the Roman limes. Uh, language leveling occurs for a variety of reasons, the most well known of which is the establishment of political authority. So this presentation argues that the key elements responsible for this major shift uh, were the adoption of the camel and the establishment of the Roman limes in North Africa. Romans engaged in military activity in North Africa from the period when they first when they first encountered the Carthaginians in the early third century BC, and the three Punic Wars finally resulted in the defeat of the Phoenicians and destruction of Carthage in 146 BC. So, as the Romans took over uh, in North Africa, we have the establishment of uh, you know classic Roman. Productive empires. I mean, Rome depended heavily on grain uh, exported from North Africa. Um, so, the greatest extent of the Roman limes was in the time of Septimus Severus, who was 193 to 211 AD. Effectively, south of this line was the uh, wild territory, the famous Garamantes uh, over here, but most of these are uh, nomadic populations who are trading desert products with the settled populations uh, north of the Limes, and therefore there's a sort of antagonistic relationship. I mean, at some point there are there's raiding and other points of trading. The Roman Limes had two functions, to act as a boundary between the barbarians beyond it, and to operate a series of custom posts, these exacted taxes on the trade across the Limes. This had an important impact on the Berber tribes beyond the line as to access Roman goods and make available the products of sub Saharan Africa. Presumably, these would include the ivory, gold, we, we think, uh, carbuncle, slaves, and wild beasts for the game, so a very important subject of trade in those days. They would have had to deal with the merchants within the Lemes according to commercial norms. So, what I'm proposing is essentially. A lingua franca develops, which is understood by all parties across the commercial zone uh, marked by the limes. Uh, just a nice picture gives you an idea of the camel caravan in the Sahara. This is the sort of thing that you could still see when I first worked in the Sahara nearly 40 years ago. I, I doubt it looks like this today. So. We've mentioned that the Limes was at its height in the reign of Septimus Severus. But as with all empires, it began to collapse at the center. The common speech community established among the Berber at this period did not last, and the current diversity began to develop. This is only sporadically developed in the late, documented in the late Latin literature, but we do have the account of the Copius better known for his scandal second of the Byzantine court. Uh, Procopius served in Africa under Belisarius, Count Belisarius, attempting to subdue what he calls the Moorish revolt. The Byzantines named the nomadic Berber tribes outside the Limes, the Marusiae, the Moors, a term which later came to apply to the Arabic-speaking Hassania, distinguishing them from the Libois, the Libyans, who were the second farmers generally considered loyal to the empire. These historical layers correspond pretty well to the layers that we can detect from the loan words um, in the tables that I, I, 
meant earlier. Picture of Procopius to remind you about him. Going on to uh, documentation, around 550 AD, Flavius Pasconius Corippus, a poet, but more crucially, a Berber, an actual indigenous of Africa, published his Johannes or De Bellis Medicis, which describes the North African war from the point of view of an outsider. However, he was pretty Romanized, so he's not so sympathetic. And he keeps abusing the Gens Numera Mororum. In particular, the treachery of their leader, Antullus, who could regard such a person today as a perfectly illegitimate leader of an insurgency. We can therefore map the way common burden develops, like Berber language develops in both agrarian nomadic groups in the might of the Roman Empire, in an era of trade and innovation in agricultural production. However, as the Roman Empire begins to rock at the center and its attention is increasingly focused uh, eastwards, the Berber outside the Limes gradually fragment. Uh, they become a, a large number of competing tribes and there is less trade. Meanwhile, they have the use of the camel. It permits a major expansion to remote areas of the desert. And the internal divisions within Berber were re-accentuated. So it essentially uh, produces the situation that we see today. Okay, so just to recap uh, what I've said here, the presentation begins with the enigma of the disconnect between the closeness of Berber Lex and the apparent antiquity of the pastoral economy in the Sahara, which should be linked to Berber expansion. Although there seems to be a link between the Berbers and pastoralism, livestock use in the Sahara cannot explain the modern pattern. Settlement of the Phoenicians in North Africa seems to have been responsible for the inception of agriculture, or at least certain plow agriculture. I mean, there's, there's clearly uh, some sort of uh, low level use of cultivated plants, but the Phoenicians uh, transformed Berber culture. Although the Romans begin to engage with North Africa on a military level for that period, it's only with the establishment of North Africa as a major element in the strategic supply of staples to the Roman Empire, that this process of language leveling begins, which eliminates much of the internal diversity of Berber. So as the Roman limes becomes consolidated, uh, the camel is adopted, long distance trade expands, we get the creation of this lingua franca, which is the ancestor of modern Berber Lex. Older Berber varieties must have been effectively eliminated through relexification, the gradual replacement of lexical and grammatical features. Even outliers such as Siwa and the Zanaga in Mauritania were affected by these changes. You might think that the isolated montane agricultural communities would not be subject to the same pressures, but their subsistence systems were also premised on borrowed Roman technology, the plough and the the idea of using orchids to cultivate fruits and tree crops. The settled Berber, therefore, of North Africa adopt the media lingua before transferring to mountainous areas. As the limes begins to erode, the Roman authority starts crumbling, and there are continuing wars for centuries. This reduce, reduces the significance of the common trading, trading model. Berber loses its coherence anew. Okay, uh, thanks for that, uh, to particular thanks to Lamy and Suag who pointed me uh, in the right direction in terms of the literature of things Berber. And uh, otherwise, this is de definitely an ongoing project.